my cue. Guess we're going to do that one on Easter, right? I think Easter came early this year. It's a great song. Our God reigns. He's alive. So do we believe that? question is, why are we here? We should be outside telling everybody that, right? <laughs> that kind of leads into that video you saw before. I thank Janet Toole for her heart for evangelism. And uh, there's no greater privilege than to share with someone the hope that's within us, that our God reigns, that he's alive, he's alive in us. That's what we've been kind of talking about, seeing that he's alive in us, that transformation. We'll talk a little bit more this week and next week, but if you really would love to share Jesus, but you've just been intimidated for whatever reason, please sign up. There's still room to sign up for sharing Jesus uh, without fear, and it's kind of dishonest to a certain extent. There's always fear, but the question is, will I allow my faith to overcome my fear, right? So I want to challenge you to that. Also, uh, it's been talked about that we are a praying church, and that's true, but I think what would even be more true is we want to be more of a praying church. And so I'm so excited. I love First Wednesdays. How many here have had an opportunity just to be at our First Wednesdays? It's exciting. We have it over in that building there. And, and God really is in the house. And if you want to really experience a touch of the living God, just come to our prayer service this Wednesday. It will be 630 over in the old sanctuary. And it it's really is a hour of power and I do want to invite you to that time well <laughs> well you're paid to be there brother all right <laughs> he's thinking about it it's all right it's all right yeah, yeah, but not enough. <laughs> not enough. <laughs> it's probably true that's probably true all right this morning uh, we're going to continue our series in the book of Ephesians, and I've entitled the message, Who is Your Role Model? Who is Your Role Model? Father, I just thank you for all that's transpired. I, I just praise you for the worship. The worship teams that we have here, Lord, it's such an incredible blessing. I just thank you for each and every one of them, each and every participant. And uh, it's just, uh, we are so blessed. And um, now as we just come to your word, Lord, just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would even come in a more powerful way than you have. I believe your word can set us free. I believe your word can set us free. And I'm just asking for great freedom even this morning. I thank you for each person that you drew here. I don't believe in any coincidences. I don't believe in any accidents. And I believe that you have drawn each and every person here. May they walk out of here with incredible life within them because Jesus is alive in them. So I say you would fill me from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head. Oh, that I would truly speak your words, Lord. And I just thank you for the fruit that will be born this morning and that Jesus will be exalted. And I just praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Skip, can you play the video? So who's your role model? You know, who are you imitating? That's how we learn. That is how we learn, through imitation interesting. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, most of you are probably familiar with Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin uh, lived in the city of Philadelphia and he tried to convince the Philadelphians, the great citizens of Philadelphia, that it would be to their advantage to light the streets at night. And he told them they would serve at least a twofold purpose. Number one, it would curtail violence and crime in the streets. And number two, it would just make it easier for people who are walking at night to traverse, you know, the uneven cobblestone street. And it seemed like a great idea, an awesome idea, but nobody was biting. So you know what Benjamin Franklin did? He bought a lamp. He polished it up. He brought a nice large bracket that would attach to the house. And then at dusk, he lit the candle, and a nice glow just emitted from the house. And pretty soon, you know, people began to notice it, and those that were walking the street in front of Franklin's house really appreciated because it just made it easier to see. 
And before you knew it, the neighbors surrounding Benjamin Franklin's house all had lamps because they saw this nice warm glow and they saw the advantage of it. And it, you can check this out. It wasn't long after that that the city of Philadelphia decided it was an absolute need to light the streets at night. You see, that's the power of example. Example will always trump teaching. Example will always trump teaching. This is, this is not going to be a parenting morning, but, you know, just a, a little rabbit trail here. You know, I wish parents understood that. Par you know, your children do not listen to what you say. How many parents kind of understand that? <laughs> a lot of parents don't understand that. You know what they do? How, you know how they learn? By your example. By your example. A lot of Christians, conservative Christians, wonder why their children rebel. It wasn't because their teaching was bad. It's because their example was bad. It was because their example was bad. I remember I had a professor in seminary that said, gentlemen, your children will magnify your heirs, your sin, tenfold. Ouch. So I'm going to ask you again, who is your role model? You do have a role model. You are pattering your life after someone. The Apostle Paul this morning tells us who the believer, though, ought to be pattering their life after. So we're going to pick it up at Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. Skip, can you put those up on the screen? Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Paul is crystal clear on this point. If you are a believer, then your example is to be Jesus. You and I are to look like Jesus. Now, I cannot tell you how many times I have heard Christians in America say, you can't be serious. Are you kidding me? You expect me to be like Jesus? That's fanatical Christianity. And so you know what they do? They join the carnal, you know, Christian club. That's what they do. I'm telling you what's happening in America. I don't know how many people I have heard who claim to be born again say, there's no way you can expect me to be like Jesus. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You're exactly, you and I are to look like Jesus. And let me tell you, if you don't look like Jesus are approaching that, what you're doing is you're causing people to stumble. You are causing people to stumble. You know, I see so many Christians in America, and what they do is they look for teachers and churches that match where they are in their mediocrity. That's not smart. That is not smart. The benchmark is Jesus Christ. You want to be challenged with that benchmark, or you'll never achieve that. But that is the goal. The goal is for you and I to look like Jesus Christ. It is absolutely possible for you and I to look like Jesus Christ. And so please do not believe a lie, anything different than that. And I'll tell you why Jesus is to be our role model. Do you realize that it is God the Father's goal? It is God the Father's goal that you look like Jesus and that I look like Jesus. We see this, in fact, in Romans chapter 8. Let's start with verse 28. We're all familiar with verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. And we know that God causes some things to work together for the good. Is that right, what it says? It says all things. Now, this is an incredible, incredible, you know, promise for the believers. But I want you to know that there's two qualifiers to it. So this is a great promise for you. You can walk out of here, and you can walk out energized. You can walk out here confident. If you are truly a believer, then everything that occurs in your life is for the good. But here's the first qualifier. The first qualifier is those who love God. You've got to love God. Now, you know, it's interesting. I will ask people, you know, do you love God? Do you love Jesus? And they'll say, well, of course I love Jesus. Of course I love God. And then I'll ask them this question. How do you know that you love Jesus? And then you get, the, well, okay. Then you hold on to that. You get this stunned look from them. And they'll go, you know, they'll go, well, you know, you know. And I'll go, no, I don't know. No, he, he, he's in my heart. Well, I said, that's awesome. Kudos for you, okay? How do you know that you really love him? What is the objective benchmark? And I actually had one person say, well, I know that I love Jesus because every time I think about him, I get warm goosebumps. 
A lady actually said to that me. I call that goosebump theology. Jesus actually gives us the answer, though, in John chapter 14, and someone yelled it out. Someone's been reading their Bible. Praise God for that. I appreciate that. In John chapter 14, it's Jesus' final night on planet Earth. And Jesus is giving some final instructions to his disciples. And he says this in John chapter 14 and verse 21. Those who accept my commandments, and when it's convenient, do them. Oh, and it says, oh, excuse me, it says obey. Obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. How do I know if I love Jesus? What's the objective benchmark? I raise my hands and I say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I, sur I surrender to you, and it is proven by my obedience to him. It is proven by my obedience to him. Have you done that? Have you ever just raised your hand and, 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 and said this? Do you just do this? Wake up in the morning. I, I challenge, Jesus, I surrender to you, and I am here all day long to obey you. You know, a lot of people kind of butcher Psalm 34, 7. Psalm 34, 7. You ever seen that one? I mean, people, people love Psalm 34, 7. I don't know, Skip, you got that one? Can you put that one up? Psalm thir or 37, 4. I'm dyslexic, so I just reverse the numbers. But people love this one. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Everybody, well, most people really, almost, the, the moment you get saved, you, know, you, you hear this one. And see, the tragedy is most people hear this. They hear, oh, you know, if I receive Jesus as my Savior, then he's going to give me my desires. He's going to give me what I want. And all I have to do is have enough faith to declare that it's true. Now, that's really nothing short, really, of witchcraft, kind of, if you, if, if, if you kind of believe that. It's really manipulation. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Do you know what the Hebrew word for delight means? It means to love God. It means to love God with all of your heart. Now listen to this. All of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. It means to love him with every fiber of your being. Then, he says, when that's true, then he will give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because, because your heart will beat after his heart. Your desires will match his Desires. Let me give you an example of this. When I was in high school, I was dating Susan senior year. We were dating. And I remember one evening, I was late, and I was going to be flying out the door to go see Susan. I said, Mom, need the keys, flying out the door, got to see Susan. She says, ah, 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 just a moment, young man. You need to clean up your dinner area, and you need to also clean up just the table in general. And I go, oh, oh, you're kidding me, you know, like I had appendicitis or something. Like I had a life sentence. So I quickly do it, run out the door, zoom over to Susan, get over to Susan, and they're just finishing dinner. And I walk in the house, and Susan says, well, you have to wait a moment. I have to clean up the table and clean off the dishes but you could join me and help me. <laughs> and I said, I'm on that. Whoa, I'm there, I'm smoking. I couldn't think of anything I'd rather do. <laughs> you see, I delighted in Susan. No, no, don't miss this. I delighted in Susan and her desires were my desires. Her desires were my desires. So that's the first thing. Do you really, really love Jesus that much that now your heart is really beating after his heart? There's a second qualifier. Psalm, or, or Romans chapter 8, verse 28. He says, for God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. Put back Romans 8, 28. Called according to his purpose means living out his purposes. Here's a question for you. When you wake up in the morning, is your first thought, okay, Lord, here I am. I surrender to you. I want, I live, I exist to expand your kingdom, and I want you to be glorified in my life today, whether it's with my spouse, whether it's with my children, whether it's with my neighbors, or whether it's with my coworkers. Or do you honestly say, okay, Lord, hey, big day today. You know, I've got a sale. I need to get this sale. Can you make sure, could you, could you give me favor, Lord, so that I could complete this sale? You know, and, and by the way, my spouse, could you fix my spouse? My spouse really needs fixing, and on and on it goes. And it's really about your kingdom. 
It's really about your glory. Which one is it? It's really one or the other. There's only two kinds of people in this world. There are those who really seek to expand Jesus' kingdom. I mean, they're really living for his glory. And then the rest of the world really just uses God, if they even believe in him. They try to manipulate him in some way or another so that he will give them what they want. Which one is it? And I, I just want you to know this morning that it says that God causes all things to work together for the good. If you really love God and you are living for his purposes, it is all good for you. I want you to know it is all good for you. And you say, well, why is that, Pastor? Verse 29, remember I always say context, 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 context is king. Look at verse 29, it says this. Now, Skip, can you put it up? For God knew, for God loved his people, it says in advance. He knew about you. And he chose him, watch this, to become like his son. So that his son would be firstborn in the Greek means preeminent among many brothers and sisters. Isn't that amazing how that matches Ephesians 5, 2? Same thing. God's goal is for you and I to look just like Jesus. You want to know what God's doing with your life? No, listen to me now. He wants you and I to look just like Jesus. Have you ever wondered why certain things happen in your life? Have you ever wondered why, wow, I don't understand why God is allowing this. I'm, I'm, I'm right now dealing with some of my own kids, and they're going through some really rough times. And they're, they always call Susan up. And they go, you know, and, and, and you hear this whining. And they go, I don't understand why this is happening. You know, I'm going to church. I'm doing this and this and this. And I just don't understand why this is happening in my life. And I said, Susan, give me the phone. I'm going to solve this problem real quick. It's because you're selfish. I was your parent, so I can say that. And he's rooting out the darkness and the selfishness. He's chipping away in your life. Bam! Anything that doesn't look like Jesus. Because, see, the Father's goal is that you look like Jesus and I look like Jesus. And guess what? It's a win-win situation. It's a win for God. It's a big W for God. Because the reason why it's a big W for God is, what's the number one reason why people don't come to church? The old H word, hypocrites. There are plenty, there, you know, there are all a bunch of hypocrites over there. You know, that's a tragedy. Because what they see is, they see carnal Christians. No, no, really. They see lukewarm Christians. And they say, that's Christianity. That's Jesus. And they sadly reject Jesus because of his church. And Jesus gets a huge black eye. So let me tell you, it is in God's best interest. He wants you to look like Jesus. He wants me to look like Jesus. He wants BCC to look like Jesus. So we don't give him a black eye in this town, all right? But it's a win for you. Listen to me. Do you know who the happiest person to ever live was? Jesus is the happy, I say he's the happiest person in the universe. He's the most well-adjusted person in the universe. He is full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. Wouldn't you love to be full of that? Now that's awesome. So let me tell you, there's no greater goal. I'm, I'm going to change. I don't know what your planner says or what your goals are. Everybody has these little goals. I'm, telling, I'm challenging you to make a goal. I want to look like Jesus. I, 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 I'm asking for a rededication even now. I want to look like Jesus. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means Ephesians 5.2. Skip, you got Ephesians 5.2. We got to rock and roll. We're going to move to the challenge. Here we go. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. What characterized Jesus' life is love. Isn't that funny? It matches 1 John 4. God is love. Jesus is love. We are what should characterize our life is love. Now, this is kind of where it gets dicey. Because, you know, we have a different definition of love than what the Bible has. Um, for example, there was this song many, many years ago, and it was entitled, How Do You Fall in Love? And the song actually answers the question. Anybody know what the answer is? How do you fall in love? The answer is, it just boom, boom happens. That's what the song says. It just boom, boom happens. No, it doesn't just boom, boom happen. Lust just boom, boom happens. Infatuation just boom, boom happens, but love doesn't just happen. Love is a decision. 
Love is a verb. Notice what it says in Ephesians 5. Jesus loved us, therefore he gave. Jesus loved, he gave himself. That's what love is. Now, as we close down, what I want to do, there's no better definition of love than 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. So I just want to briefly rock and roll through that just so you have an understanding of that. I, I, I'm asking everyone that we would memorize this because if we can live out 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, wow, you are going to begin to go on the ride of your life. So 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says love is patient, right? That, you know what that means? It means it's long-suffering. Patience always in long-suffering has to do with people, not things. Remember, people matter, things rust. People matter, things burn. People matter, things eventually just go away. People matter. Now, you know what the problem is with most people? They think they're normal. No, really, most people think they're normal, and they don't realize that they're kind of weird, kind of like this. Skip, can you put up the picture? Okay, yeah, that's it. Now see, and, and I have to work with that, okay? <laughs> see, see, people are weird. People are weird. Jesus is normal. No, Jesus is normal. We are not. Everyone, we can all laugh, but we all are weird. And because we don't look like Jesus, and a lot of people are far away from Jesus, guess what's going to happen? They're going to make your life tough. People hurt. No, no. People hurt. I'm a high introvert. I'll be real honest with you. If I could stay in my apartment, I'd tell Susan, can I just retire and just stay here? Because people hurt. They hurt because they're not like Jesus. And that's why you and I need to be paid. I do. I say, Lord, give me long suffering. See, that's part of love. Give me long suffering. All right, then it says, love is patient and love is kind. You know what that means? That simply means that love does something good or beneficial for someone. The great story, of course, is Skip put up the picture is the Good Samaritan. We don't have a lot of time here. But every one of us knows the story of Good Samaritan. Can you believe there's a Jew? He's hurting. A priest walks by, a Jewish priest and a Levite. He's like an assistant priest. And it's, it's a Samaritan. It's a dirty, rotten Samaritan that stops and helps him out. That's kindness. We're supposed to be kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Better, envious. Love is not, and you know what that means? It means love does not seek your neighbor's beamer. Love does not seek your neighbor's wife. Love does not seek your neighbor's house. Instead, love practices 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verses 6 through 8. Skip, can you put those up? Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be, let us be. Now, we're going to talk more about this next week, because I think it's an important thing, because Americans aren't content. But let me tell you what the real gift is. The real gift, and I'm going to tell you about it next week, is enjoying what you have is enjoying what you have. All right, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious. Then he says, love does not boast. You know what that means? What that means is you don't blow, blow a lot of hot air around about yourself. You're not puffed up. Question, you're in a conversation with a person or a group of people. What are you thinking? Are you thinking, wow, how can I direct this conversation so that people notice me? I'm wonderful, and they just need to know that I'm wonderful. <laughs> now, see, we laugh at that, or really, seriously, though, are you thinking, wow, how can I build that person up? How can I, how, see, my goal, my goal is how can I help that person win? How can I encourage that person? See, that's what it means for love. That's the positive side. Love does not boast. Then he moves on, and he says, love is not proud. Now, this is bad. This is worse than boasting. Pride is deep. Because you know what pride is? Pride really says that I'm better. I'm better than. I'm better than the person sitting next to me. And it gives you the right to treat them in a rotten way. Ronald Reagan. Many of you know Ronald Reagan. He was the 40th president of the United States. Pretty, pretty powerful man, don't you think? And I've read a few biographies on Reagan. One of the amazing things about the 40th president of the United States is they said when Ronald Reagan would see his butler in the morning, 
They said you would have thought the guy was, you know, the most powerful person on planet Earth. The most important person, because they said Ronald Reagan would address him. He'd be excited. He'd be paying attention to him. And then later in the day, he would see some head of state. And Ronald Reagan didn't treat the head of state any different than he did the butler. They said that's one of the things that made Ronald Reagan incredible. He made every single person that he was dealing with feel like a million bucks. He looked at him in the eyes, he paid attention to him, and he made him feel like a million bucks. You know, and I don't understand it. If we're born again Christians, how can we possibly think we're better than anyone else? Skip, can you put up that picture? You know, if you recognize what Jesus did on the cross and you're standing at the cross, the only way you can be standing there is you recognize that you're a sinner and you're saved by grace. How can, how can that make you better than anyone else? If you're truly been saved and you're just a sinner saved by grace, how can we possibly, possibly ever have any arrogance thinking that we're better than everyone else? All right, skip, move it on. Then it says this, that love is not rude. Rude. Woo. Americans know how to be rude, don't we? Now, I happen to live in Adam's Station. Adam's Station, if you live in Adam's Station, people have animals. They have dogs. A lot of them have dogs. And you know what? They have a little rule at Adam's Station that if you have a dog, you're supposed to pick up your dog's emissions. There's emissions problems at Adam's Station. And so... Susan really has a pet peeve about this, actually. It's, you know, I don't mind. But anyhow, she's walking along one day, and she suddenly sees, now this dog, must, it was huge, because it had a huge emissions problem. <laughs> and she almost stepped on it, and, 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 and you could see the heat coming off it, so it was, it was just newly done. And right there, just in front of her, maybe 30 yards, was a guy with this huge dog, okay? And Susan wanted to give the guy a piece of her mind. But the Holy Spirit hit her upside the head first. And he said, you pick, the, you pick up the emissions. Now, Susan always has some plastic in her pocket. Don't ask me why, okay? The fetish. She takes a plastic bag out. The guy's watching her. She picks up the emissions, holds it up, and then she puts it into the garbage can. And then she walks towards the guy. Now, now Susan's a little thing, you know, but she packs a powerful punch. So this guy's pretty nervous, and Susan pulls out a track and says, here, God wanted me to give this to you. And then she walks on. You think the guy was blown away? Now, that's a new technique for witnessing. I can re- if you'd like to know how you can meet people, that's one of the ways that you can do it. Love, though, isn't rude. It really isn't rude. Skip, we got to move it on. What's the next one? Then he says this, love is not, or does not demand its own way. That means love isn't selfish. Now, that's a big problem in marriage, isn't it? Now, Susan and I, how many like to go out to eat once in a while? Okay, and and, and usually you're different than your spouse, right? See, if, if I had my way, we'd go to McDonald's. I don't think there's any better place than McDonald's. There is nothing like a Big Mac with fries. Nothing's gonna beat that. Now, Susan on the other house, she likes Alice's organic salad house. <laughs> now, see, that's a problem. Now, where do you think we're going to end up going? <laughs> Not even Panera's. We're going to go to Alice's organic salad house. <laughs> see, love does not demand its own way. What changes would occur in our marriages if we just began to function that way? All right, Skip, put up the next one. Then it says, love is not irritable. That just means, refer back to the first one, love is patient. Love is patient with people. Love is long-suffering. Skip, put up the next one. It keeps no record of being wrong. Do you know what that means? It means that love forgives. Love forgives. Let me just plant a little fear in you. Skip, put up Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. These are Jesus' words. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sin. That verse terrifies me. What it says is if you are unwilling not to hold people hostage, in other words, if you, someone sins against you and, and you're unwilling to forgive them and you're going to hold them hostage to your, their sin, God, Jesus, will hold you hostage to your sins. How would you like that? No, that thing terrifies me. Love forgives. It keeps no record of wrongs. 
Skip put up the next one. It says, love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. You know, this is a great deception on our part. You know, love does not rejoice about evil. You know, I, I know people who will sit there and say, I wouldn't commit adultery, right? But then what kind of programs are you watching on television? What, what kind of music are you listening to? What do you read? I know people that wouldn't commit murder. But what kind of programs are you watching? You're watching these shows where bodies are just piled up. And we think that doesn't affect us. It does affect us. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, Psalm 1, who does not stand in the path of sin, who does not sit in the seat of scoffer. That is a progression. How in the world do you end up being a scoffer? It starts by being in the counsel of the wicked. Television programs, movies you're watching. Don't tell me it doesn't affect you. It's naive at the very best. It's hypocritical at the worst. And let me tell you, it causes people to stumble. Wish we had more time on this. Skip, can you go to the next one? Then it says this. Philippians 4, it says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Here's what we should be fixing our mind. Watch this. Fix your thoughts on whatever is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. What happens when you start doing this? Light starts coming in your soul. You know, depression's moved away. Victory happens in your life. Please look at Philippians 4, 8, not the trash that we see on the television and music and what we read. Hurry up, Skip. What's the next one? Love, I, I love this, and he ends up with a flourish. Love never gives up. Love just keeps on keeping on. Love never loses faith. You know why it never loses faith? Because love knows in the end love will win. Love will defeat evil. Love will defeat Satan. I want you to know that. It is always hopeful. You know why it's hopeful? Because I know that love incarnate Jesus Christ is coming back one day. He's going to establish his eternal kingdom forever. That's why love always hopes. I know that love's going to also win. And then it endures through every circumstance. Love never quits. Love never quits. Guess what? Jesus is love, and guess what? He never quits on you. He never quits on you. So why do we quit? Who's your role model? I'm going to challenge you to have the greatest role model ever, Jesus. You, you choose Jesus, and you win, and Jesus' kingdom will win. Father, <laughs> I pray we really just really think about who is our role model so often. We have sports people, celebrities, and their lives are all messed up. Lord, my prayer is that we will repent of that. And today, right now, right now, we're going to rededicate our life to Jesus Christ and say, from here on out, I'm going to follow the greatest role model. I just pray during this last song, you'll, you'll be doing incredible business in all of us. And then we have a win-win situation, and I ask for this in your precious name. Amen. What an awesome song to end up with. Give me a heart like yours. Wow. <laughs> just imagine if every person in the world had a heart like Jesus. We didn't have any wars. We didn't have any poverty. Couples divorce, parents rebelling. Wow. Please don't forget Janet in the back if you're interested in how you can share Jesus without fear. I, th I think we got the sportsman uh, thing coming up on Saturday. It's going to be an awesome opportunity. Free food, you know, can't pass that up. But please, even more important, don't forget Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30. I'll tell you, it's going to be power-packed. really want to invite you to that, that, that hour of prayer. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And I pray that he would give you a heart like Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Jesus, if you've never trusted in Jesus, please come up. We've got people here. If you want to really dedicate your life, and you want to make Jesus your role model, we got people praying up here for you. God bless you and take care.